Okay, so we're about to begin. I see a few more people entering. Welcome, welcome to the National Archives Know Your Records program. My name is Andrea Bassing Matney, and we're so pleased that you're here. For those of you who have joined us on site in Washington, D.C., we're broadcasting from this building. However, our presenter, Susan Karen, is actually in Seattle, Washington. So before we begin, for those of you who didn't hear before, if you're here on site, we will take your questions at the end of the program. If you'll uh, make your way to one of the microphones in the aisles, that would be helpful. That way the presenter can hear you. For those of you who are watching on this YouTube channel, welcome. If you're watching live, we will also take your questions. You'll first need to log into this chat uh, on this YouTube webpage and type your questions in and we will ask the presenter your questions for you. Also on this webpage, you can download the presentation slides. As it's a hyperlink under the video screen. And you'll also see a hyperlink to live captioning. So for today's program, it is entitled, Oh, the Stories They Tell, Chinese Exclusion Acts, Case Files at the National Archives. Susan Karen will discuss Chinese Exclusion Act records in recognition of the Act's 135th anniversary. Susan Karen is the director of the National Archives at Seattle. She has been with the National Archives for 30 years, 27 of them in Seattle. The other years were spent in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Susan received her M.A. in History from Brigham Young University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our presenter, Susan Karen. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I know it's afternoon back there, but I'm going this morning because it's still morning. The records I'm going to talk about are challenging to use, are only partially name indexed, and not all indexes are available online. To make matters worse, the official name on the case file may not be the name by which the person was commonly known, even by their family. Although some examples of records found in the case files are available online, entire case files are not, and some of the records in the case files may still be restricted even now for privacy reasons. Finally, I want to note that what's in these case files is merely what someone told the government. The records should not be considered to be the gospel truth about a family's makeup, origins, village, or even life in the United States. This is true because many Chinese immigrants participated in immigration fraud in one form or the another to just get here. Sometimes this is documented in the file, but nonetheless, the case files are still a rich and rewarding source for family history and well worth the search involved. Know that despite the difficulties, hundreds of people are successful in their searches each year. And I want to add that these files are also useful, useful to social historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, among others. You can take comfort if you're looking for family history and knowing that their search will be immensely more difficult than yours. I'm going to warn you that using the records for non-specific name research is difficult. Of course, name-specific research isn't always any easier, but recognizing this, most of the facilities that hold these records have tried to augment agency-created indexes with indexes of their own. And it was using just such an index that I found the examples that I'm going to share with you today. As with any records, uh, next slide, please. As with any records, you need to know why and when they were created in order to determine whether they'll be useful to you. So I'm going to start with a short history. The original law was passed in 1882. This was the first U.S. law to ban immigration by race or nationality. It suspended immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years. Although Chinese in the United States in 1880 were permitted to stay, and they could also travel abroad and return. It established a special exempt status for merchants, teachers, students, and travelers. In 1892, the Geary Act extended this act for 10 more years. The law required all Chinese residents of the United States to carry a residence permit, sort of an internal passport. 
Failure to carry the permit at all times was punishable by de deportation or a year of hard labor. This law was then renewed every 10 years until 1943. From 1882 until the 1900s, exclusion was enforced by customs, with an enforcement in the 1890s shared by customs and the newly created Bureau of Immigration, later INS. Customs did not keep case files, and the few customs records that survive here in Seattle are merely name lists with no further identifying information, not even the village from which the person came. Workers who came to the United States to build the railroads in the 1860s and 70s arrived too early to show up in these or later INS records unless they had a fairly long life and they left in return to the United States after exclusion started. INS was responsible for the tracking that resulted in the case files that we have. With some variance, the laws affected all persons of Chinese ancestry, even those who were citizens by birth. If they left or were returning to the United States or entering the United States for the first time. Bear in mind that this is, is Bear in mind that this is not just actual Chinese ancestry for anyone who was legally considered to be Chinese by the INS. I'm going to explain that a little bit later. The crucial issue for admission was the occupational category into which a person fell, but the records are not indexed this way. You don't want to start your search based solely on occupation. As with immigrants, Chinese were funneled through certain ports of entry that varied from time to time. These included San Diego, Los Angeles, Long Beach, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle and Port Townsend on the West Coast, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia on the East Coast, Minneapolis and Detroit along the northern border, and a number of smaller subports that related that reported to larger Immigrants then spread throughout the United States from there. I haven't actually checked our index, but off the top of my head, the only state I have not seen Chinese immigrants residing was New Mexico. Uh, some may have entered through Western Canada initially, taken the Canadian Pacific Railroad across the top of Canada, and entered the United States through an East Coast port, Boston or New York, or Northern Tier port, such as Portal, North Dakota, Helena, Montana, Chicago, or St. Paul. For that reason, subports were also established in Montreal and Vancouver, British Columbia, to take care of those who were traveling into Canada, but then immediately transiting to the United States. We also see some Chinese who were immigrated after living in or visiting Europe, South America, Mexico, or Cuba, for example. The cities of residence that the person where the person lives may not have any relation to the city where they first encountered the INS or its predecessors, and it's that latter city that's crucial for finding the records. Most case files date from 1890s or later, depending on when the initial contact with the INS occurred. And the bulk of Seattle and, and Seattle's files are from the 1900s to 1943. Some early INS files may have Bureau of Customs created documents or court early court documents in them. New slide, please. The files may contain photos, transcripts of interrogations in various forms, and in addition, some early INS files, as I mentioned, may have Bureau of Customs created documents in them as well. Court affidavits dating from the 1880s and the 1890s. Each district arranged their own records. Arrangement may have been based on how busy they were, by the types of cases they were seeing, and sometimes even by personal preference of the clerk. This all makes it a little more challenging. In Seattle, the files are arranged by INS district, 
either the Seattle district or the Portland district, then by subport, and then by case file number. We actually don't know how the INS created the case file numbers, but can guess. Early on, INS may have assigned numbers sequentially, but that quickly got out of hand. Then they moved to a numeric system that includes hyphens and slashes. In many cases, these numbers appear to be linked to the person's arrival ticket number, which can often be found in arrival lists or in arrival volumes. This may have been the nationwide numbering scheme that was eventually adopted. But numbering early on seems to be location dependent. Because the ticket number was linked to a specific port, these numbers can help us determine where the file may have ended up. New slide, please. So where do you look for these? As you can see, it all makes searching difficult. A person may have lived in Seattle most or all of their time in the United States, but if he entered the country through San Francisco, then his record would be held by the National Archives at San Francisco. Although some multiple files have been found when a person lived in a city in one INS district and arrived and departed and returned through a second, this isn't always the case. It also appears to be the exception rather than the rule, as many cases have correspondence that indicates that the files were regularly shipped to other ports and then returned. We have also come across a few cases where the records appeared not to have been sent back to the originating district, and hence were never transferred to NARA. And if this is the case, then we're lucky to have as much as we do. During processing, if, we come, if NARA comes across an unreturned case file, we've tried to get it back to where it should be. New slide, please. As I indicated, this covered everyone of Chinese descent. All persons were required to go through this process from daily laborers, and that's sometimes very broadly defined, to diplomats, merchants, businessmen, students, performers, children, to name a few, as well as those non-ethnic Chinese INS legally considered to be Chinese. Yeah, I, I can see your puzzled looks from here. The silver lining to this dark cloud in the U.S. history is that we have many of these case files and with them many times a wealth of information. New slide, please. As an example, Anna Mae Wong is a very well-known American Chinese an, um, actress who was born in the United in Los Angeles, she is a U.S. citizen, but when traveling to Canada for a film shoot, she had a file created for her in Seattle. The file contained proof of U.S. birth in the form of a court affidavit that was filed by her father in Los Angeles. The photo on the right is from this document. As you can see, She's dressed in traditional Chinese attire, and she's darling. These provide us with a unique view of a person's life, and one that's not necessarily seen or one that's glossed over in a biography that focuses on her career or public life. As an example of this, all forms have, a minute, have minute physical descriptions of scars and such. If you look in the center of the, the form that's on the left, there's a part that's called physical marks. It indicates that she has a scar on the end of her left hand. I really want to know how large a scar would have to be to get noted. And I'm pretty sure that those two lines aren't going to be enough if I were filling out the form for all of my scars. New slide, please. As we saw from the previous page, even head and shoulder passport style images can provide information to the social historian. Changes in style are unintentionally documented. You see the changes in fashion over time. You see the Americanization of the person. Family portrait styles change. 
and you see the interiors and exteriors of Chinese business as, as well. Next slide, please. You can even watch your ancestor grow up. This series is, of images over 20 years show the changes in style as well as the immigration of Mr. Chun. We start with Mr. Chun as an infant. In the next photo, we see him as a seven-year-old with his father. Move on, moving on to 1906, he's 14 years old with his sister. And in the final image, we see him as, as a young businessman of 22. The Americanization process is complete. Now, slide 13, please. Next slide. We also see a number of photos, um, and they're prime fam from families that are primarily used to verify that a person really did belong to the family he claimed. Person, people were asked to compare, um, were asked to identify who the people were in the image. In this case, you see the names of the persons have been noted on the file. Again, it's not really sure whether the person themselves noted the names or whether this would have been a duplicate copy that would have been with the INS inspector and the INS inspector would hand him a, a copy without the names and have him to identify them. Um, we're going to see a second picture in a minute, same family, only months apart. And you're going to see how they, they use these, these images. People were required to identify correctly all of the people in the photo, many of whom they may not have seen for years. I want you to imagine doing this for your extended family, some of whom you have not seen for many years. How often have we received a Christmas card and tried to figure out just who those people are in the picture? Next slide, please. As I said, this is the same family as the previous image. This photo was submitted for an arrival, investi arrival investigation. The previous photo was submitted for a departure investigation. And again, you saw the changes in style. The first is a very formal portrait of the family. The second is a one that's a little bit more informal. Next slide, please. I previously mentioned the law applied to those who were not ethnically Chinese, but who were considered to be Chinese under the law. Yes, Mary Yi, over there on the top left, is in the eyes of INS Chinese. The Cable Act of 1922 reaffirmed that women who had married an alien took the nationality of her husband. INS saw the women as Chinese. In fact, I believe the law applied to men as well, but you don't really see it rigorously applied. And I have never seen a case file where a Caucasian man is considered to be Chinese because he married a Chinese woman. As a result, we do see some fi mixed families, and we, we have at least a half a dozen that we've identified here in Seattle. Um, as you, we're going to see um, later, INS inspectors don't really um, understand the, this law either. So don't feel bad if you do. In this particular case, Mary Lasky Yi and her husband Harry were taking their children to China for education. Because the children were returning at different times, each also has their own case file. Personally, I always wanted to know what Harry's mother said when he introduced his wife. Here's a, this is a really good example of interrogations and the type of information you can get from them. 
they can provide birth information. We uh, see that Mary was born in the United States. She's a, a, a Finnish extraction. And she's a U.S. citizen because she's born in Michigan, but we know she's lost her, China, her citizenship because she marries Harry. Um, we also know that the, the family owns a, a, a five-room home in Sioux Falls, South Dakota that is in their names jointly. Um, they paid $2,500 for it, and then they put another $2,000 in for improvement. Again, information about the family that's just invaluable. Additional types of, next slide please. Additional types of forms, this particular form is a note summarizing Mary Yee's history. And it's difficult to tell when it was created. It may have been created following her testimony as a summary, or it may have been created prior to the interrogation to help INS form the questions and test and confirm her answers. Um, just because I'm curious, I uh, checked Google Maps for the address, and it's now an empty lot. You can see I've highlighted an area that confers their children's citizenship by birth, as well as Mary, since she's born in the United States. Because, and according to the Cable Act, she loses her citizenship, but nevertheless, the last lines here say that she does not require any certificate under the law. Next slide, please. Apparently, Inspector Horton is quickly corrected by an unknown person saying that he's wrong and that she does need papers. Um, this is really why we see different enforcement actions over time, because not even INS understood how the laws were to be applied. Next slide, please. So how do you prove you are who you say you are when you don't have things like fingerprints, which were not really used at that time? The use of interrogations is a big part of these files. And often the, the INS used interrogations from other family members to verify what was seen, said by the applicant. And for this reason, the case files often can contain duplicate copies of interrogations from family members. When reading these files, it's really important to keep track of who is being interrogated and not assume that all of the interrogations relate specifically to the person you're searching for or whose file it is. Ancestors can include the distance to a community well, the names of neighbors, and not just immediate ones, or detailed descriptions of interiors of homes, including the number of stairs to the front door or the second floor. When we first got these case files, and I saw that this is what they were doing, I called my sister. We shared a bedroom for 16 sometimes bloody years. So I asked her to describe our bedroom in 1973. It took us about a week and finally a phone call to my mother to figure out which house we were living in in 1973. As I was suspected, I was correct. We described our bedrooms and then compared our descriptions. One of us, or both of us for that matter, would not have been admitted to the country based on our description because we described two completely different bedrooms. Next slide, please. So the name, the, the interrogations inc vary depending on a per person's situation. 
but generally they're going to include a name, age, place of birth, their marital status, and the place of their marriage and their occupation. Many other names show up in these case files. Young people were given a student name. Men were given a marriage name. Then there's the name by which they went in business in the United States as they Americanized their name. Harry, Harry's Yi's name is actually Yi Xing. So in our indexes, we're collecting all of these names because, as I said earlier, the name on the case file may not necessarily be the, the name by which the person was known to by the family. And as I said, they often compare the interrogations found in other fam files with previous interrogations to ensure con consistency. Many files are incredibly rich, giving many details about a person's life. Travel history, descriptions of cities, towns, and villages, the number and names of children. Although I find it interesting that very often they will say, how many children do you have? I have, I have four. And then later you find out that, that is four sons and two daughters. So apparently, daughters didn't count in the total. Next slide, please. The, the person's occupation or their status is directly linked to whether they would be exempt and allowed into the country or not. The files, because of this, this is so crucial. The file can contain photos of Chinese businesses across the United States. The images I'm going to show you were taken in the first decade of the 20th century, and they're going to be invaluable to social historians. Then I also have three businesses from the same de decade that are geographically dispersed. Note the dis the differences in the development of cities and towns. If they show up in a fam file linked to your family, it would be a true winner. All of these are going to be, I believe, exterior photos, but we do have interior photos as well. Next slide, please. So this is what Olympia, Washington, 5th and Columbia, looked like in 1903. The questions generally focused on building usage, including information on the building ownership and rent payment, as well as whether it was used as a gambling establishment, opium den, or boarding house for Chinese. It's a very typical question. Next slide, please. The Tung Tuk, the Tung. Tuck Tongue Company in Seattle, Washington in 1905, the question was whether this was a gambling establishment. Gambling seems to be a big issue in these interrogation, as does building usage as an opium dead or a boarding house. An unscientific survey of files, based primarily on those I've looked at briefly, leads me to think that more Chinese were not admitted because they owned or operated a laundry establishment than because of owning or operating a gambling den. And we can see th these are interiors of the building, and you'll, you'll note that up at the very top shelf on the left photo, there are packages that are wrapped up. I've never seen what was inside these packages, but in many cases, this is a good indication that there was a laundry establishment. Next slide, please. This is an image of, from Austin, Texas. Um, Google Maps shows us this location is now a Bank of America. But in 1904, it was a chop suey house. Next slide, please. 
Also from the Seattle Files, the Lee Bing business a, in Mount Holyoke, Massachusetts. And again, the issue is whether a person is a laborer or a merchant. And you see that they, you have bundles in the lower photo that could possibly be construed to be laundry, which would be a very big no-no. I suspect that the inspectors went in and took photos without warning the uh, businessmen ahead of time. Next slide, please. From St. Louis, Missouri, we have the Lace House Dry Goods Company. And this is from the file of Lu Wa Ho, who is the partner shown the second from the left. Um, from the variety of places I just showed you, the Seattle case files show businesses from across the United States. Um, the Seattle files were also um, used for a history of Chinese in Deadwood, South Dakota. It took a while to find them all. But this led, eventually led to a large family or town reunion for those Chinese who were descended from the original Deadwood uh, Chinese. And um, we were actually invited to the, the reunion. Unfortunately, none of us were able to make it. Next slide. Um, maps are used very often. Uh, returning applicants may have been given pre-printed maps of the city where they were supposed to be from and asked to identify where specific businesses were in the city or in the Chinatown, in this case. Next slide. Those who said they were living in Seattle prior to 1884, 18, I'm sorry, 1889, were often asked to identify specific information pre and post fire even many years after the event. It was not clear from this map whether it was used to verify one that was drawn by an applicant or whether it was a type transcript of one that was drawn by an applicant. I suspect it may have been the latter. But from an urban historian, it's a gold mine of information. Um, this particular map actually confirmed to a, a uh, historian of urban uh, Seattle that the streets had been moved. And what we know now, we now know as Yesler was formerly Mill Street. Next slide. Maps can often be hand drawn. Um, and as you can imagine, that may be why the type transcript was created in the previous one. This is actually a village map, so an original sketch by a father with some translations and annotations from 1924. It could have been used to compare with one that was drawn by a son or used when questioning a child entering for the first time. And remember, one person may not have visited the village for many years, and the other may have had a child's view of that village. We've had students that have come to use our case files as part of class visits. And when we do this, I often will ask them to take out a piece of paper and draw a quick map of their school. And then we always have great fun in trying to figure out which people actually go to the school. Because in looking at the maps, you often think they all go to different schools. Maps such as this as these have been used by people planning a trip to their ancestral village. And researchers have come back after such trips to show us photos and to tell us that in some cases, not much has changed. Next slide, please. So how do you locate a file? A case number is gold. Do you have any documents the person you're searching for may have left behind. Because if you do, you may already have what you need. Or have you located a file for another family member? If you have, check for a cross-reference sheet. 
I'm going to show you examples of these items. If you have them, go buy a lot of tickets. You're more than halfway there, maybe. Next slide. Certificates of identity were issued. Very often, they don't have the case file number on them. They were given to the applicant, and many, but they were given to the applicant. Many of these cases, these certificates are turned in and are, show up in the case files. But we have had people who have come in with these and said, will this help? Even if it doesn't have a case number on it, it may lead to a case name, which can lead to a case. However, you still need to know when and where they first arrived. Next slide, please. This is the, these are those certificates of residence that people had to carry with them. These would have remained with the person, although some were surrendered as part of the departure process, which is why we have this example. You need to look closely at the documents because the case numbers aren't always clear. And it doesn't appear for some reason that they ever actually had a line that said case number. Archivists who work with these records can be your best friend. We know what to look for and what file numbers look like. The case number for this file has been written in the upper right. I've circled it in red. As mentioned, early file, case file numbers are not always clearly a case file number, but later numbers often match the ticket number, which appears to have been issued specifically by port. In this case, by this time, Seattle is actually using a stamp with Seattle underneath it, and then the case file number. Next slide. Permits to re-enter were issued to a person after they had gone through the departure process. Re-enter, re-permits should have been turned in when the person returned, but these are a good example of how a case file gets noted. You can see down below the, the uh, blue permit is, again, one of those that has the stamp and the number. However, the, the gentleman's permit at the top just has the number, the case file number, scribbled in and, and put onto it that way. Um, the more formal notations, or the later the document, the form, more formal the notations seem to get. But I still have yet to see one of these documents that actually has a specific place where you're supposed to write a case file number. And finally, Cross-reference sheets. This is a particularly unusual one. Most cross-reference sheets aren't this extensive, nor do they have as many women listed as this one does. Most are more like the one, the second, the, or the bottom sheet that has just a few listed in them. They can be highly useful for locating groups of families, or a specific individual for whom we can't find a case number. These particular case files are all Seattle numbers, except for those that start with the DS. We would have to look to see if we actually have the file. All case files, all files Mark brought forward represent separate entries for the same person and consolidated into this particular file. Generally, when we see a case file created, we see a case file created, you're just going to add additional documents to it, and that number stays the same. Uh, that's not the case with Seattle. Each time the person left and returned, a new file was created based on the new ticket number or whatever numbering scheme was being used at the time. And previous files for that same person were then added to that file. Um, in the case of San Francisco, they also did this, but they were kind enough to leave a cross-reference form indicating where the file had been moved to. 
Seattle, the Seattle District Office did not leave a charge out indicating the new file number. A gap in the file numbers is our only clue that there may be a later file or that that file was pooled sometime after 1943 and included in a newly created alien file or A file if the travel occurred after 1943, or a C file if the person applied for citizenship once Chinese were allowed to do so. Again, in San Francisco, they, if they had pulled these and put them into a new series of records, they put the new A file or C file number. Seattle did not. And there, I can tell you, are many times when I have condemned former clerks at INS for not doing this. Indexes were created. Um, if INS indexes exist, they reflect what the agency had in hand when the index was created. The file may not have been transferred to us, even if an index card was created. NAR created indexes exist fully or in part for some ports, and some of these are online. But if you can't find it online, don't give up. Talk to an archivist. For example, the index for the Seattle District is a work in progress. By work in progress, this is a 25-plus year, year plus project. But our volunteers have complete, completed a skeleton index with just the file name and the case number for the remaining and then next cases. I, thanks to our wonderful team of volunteers, we're close. And once we get this index completed, we're going to put it online. For other ports, you're going to need to check with field facilities servicing that state or that port to see about the availability of indexes. Unfortunately, there is no nationwide index. Yes, hopefully we'll get there. So how else can you find information? You're going to do a lot of this the same way you're going to do any other genealogy search. You're going to gather whatever information you can get, whatever clues you can get from other family members. When and where did the person first arrive or leave, or any other travel back and forth will help. Who were they traveling with? Most modern arrival records um, into the United States are online, or available online, at least those that they still exist. They will list a ticket number, and knowing the port and the ticket number can help if that arrival is the first one. And if you're not sure what the ticket number is, share a copy of the arrival list with the staff, and we can try to identify it. Remember, we can't actually do that portion of the search for you, but it is available online. And some people travel between the U.S. and China many times, so this can give us some clues as to where to look. Next slide. If the usual means fail, we can sometimes find success locating files for collateral family. Again, this is a, a technique used a lot in any kind of genealogy searches. Don't be surprised if we start asking broader questions because every little bit of information helps, even if it doesn't seem like it's relevant. Remember those cross-reference sheets? They can be useful if you're looking for a, an uncle and you find the nephew and the uncle file is listed. There wasn't a standard for keeping these records, and over time, Many ports tweak the record keeping process, so it does change over time from port to port. What works for one port's records may not work for another, but just because it doesn't work in one place doesn't mean the process should be ignored altogether. Each district, as I said, kept files just a little bit differently, and for that reason, you need to have a conversation. Email conversations are great with the facility that likely holds the records you're looking for. Don't assume you can find it online. 
very little is. And don't assume no. Don't assume that it wouldn't have happened because the second you say no and don't even try to search, well, you've already cut off a, an avenue that may actually be very fruitful. Ask us. There may be a quirk in the records that we know of that can help. Next slide. So, remember, gather what documents you have, even if you're not sure what they are. Get creative and ask an archivist. Oh, and those boxes to my right there, those are filled with the Exclusion Act case files we're talking about. And those shelves have our double shelf. There's a box behind the boxes you see. However, good luck. And I'd be happy to take any questions if we have some time. I think we do. Yes, please, if you have any questions um, while you make your way to the microphone so our uh, presenter can hear you. Uh, Sue, could you tell us a little bit more about the A files? What does A file stand for and what might uh, a researcher find in an A file? A files are uh, alien files. These are files that were created by INS starting in just after the Second World War for all immigrants that came to the United States. Um, some of the early ones have been transferred to the National Archives, and those that have been transferred to the National Archives have, those names are available in our catalog. So if you have an, an ancestor who arrived in the United States, it's dependent on the age of the person as to when they're transferred to the U.S., but those files are now, they're actually held by our um, facility in Kansas City. Um, and uh, there, I think, believe, are a few in, in San Bruno, San Francisco as well. Um, and those are going to be very, very similar to the exclusion ca case files. I don't know that there's the um, as many interrogations as there are in the exclusion files, but there are going to be the, the documentation of that person's um, arrival in, in, into the United States and, and stay. Thank you, Sue. Do we have any questions from our audience on site? Yes, we have somebody. Please. Um, hello. I have a question. I didn't quite understand your point about something about laundries being no-nos. Um, there were, in terms of them being, I guess, businessmen. Um, so laundries, of course, were businesses, uh, whoever was in them. It could have been the worker, but it also could have been the owner, who could also, also be a, a and uh, a worker as well, um, but they they are bona fide laundries. They have they are paper wrapped clothing inside those little stacked you know, wrapped packages. So I I, I just want I appreciate if you would clarify what you meant by it being a no no. It appears that businessmen who were laundrymen were not did not fall under a businessman exempt category. For some reason, Chinese who ran laundries, despite the fact that probably a lot of their business came from the Caucasian business community, were considered laborers and had labor stat labor status rather than businessman exempt status. And so when you have these, these businesses that are clearly, you know, obviously not just a laundry, um, they, they seem to be very, the INS at various points seem to be very fixated on that as a way of excluding um, a Chinese person or allowing them to return if they were departing. That, did that make it clear? Probably not. Um, yeah, I just hadn't heard that before. That's very interesting because there were a lot, especially in San Francisco, a lot of regulations passed specifically against Chan Chinese laundrymen. So this is another attempt to prevent them from being able to operate and to earn a living and to be considered businessmen, which they obviously were. So, but that's right. it's an interesting thing. Yeah, no, they, it, 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 it depends on 
In many cases, it really depends. I have seen it depends on the time. It depends on the the city, the location. Um, there was not a nationwide understanding of the rules and enforcement of the rules. Thank you, Sue. Do we have any more questions from our on-site audience? And if you're thinking of something, please make your way to a microphone. I have a question for you from somebody who's watching online on YouTube, and she asks, would there be files for sailors who were in port but not trying to stay? No, this, these are only files for people who were staying. Now, bear in mind, many of those sailors may have jumped ship and, and gotten into the country and, and just started blending with the population. And as long as they weren't stopped and asked for any paperwork, they, they would be allowed to stay. But there would not be any documentation on that. What you might find are in the um, some of the arrival um, paperwork that is um, online. There are actually just arrivals for ship crews, ship's crew, and those they the person might be listed in there. But then all you're going to have is the entry in that that line entry. You're not going to have the case file like you have here. Thank you, Sue. Do we have any more questions from our on-site audience? Yeah. If you have another question, please make your way to, to a microphone. And while we're waiting, uh, I, we do have somebody uh, coming up. And I find that we have an old slide up. And I just wanted to point out that Susan's actually been working for the archives for 30 years, not 26, and so on. So yes, please, sir. Hi, uh, yes, uh, my name's Steve. Uh, my grandfather was uh, a diplomat, uh, but uh, from Cuba. And uh, I saw that um, some came, you know, a large Chinese population from the South America. He was also um, an ambassador to Guatemala for, for China. But um, about five years ago, I was doing some uh, research, and I saw that the FBI had files on him that I could not see. I was wondering if the archive lets you research for those FBI files that were were investigating him. Was an FBI file? What date is the FBI file? Uh, it was, um, uh, I think, around 1944, 19, in the 40s. You know, you might want to talk to the folks in College Park. And because they hold the FBI files. If the files have been transferred to NARA, then if they are open, you can certainly see them and research them. If they haven't been transferred and they're with the FBI, you might want to file a Freedom of Information Act request for them. But 1944, if the file was permanent, then they may, um, they, they would, likely have already been transferred and they'd be in College Park. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And while we're waiting for somebody else to ask a question, I just wanted to point out when she says College Park, we're talking about College Park, Maryland, and we have a free shuttle bus that runs between the DC facility and the College Park facility every hour on the hour, starting at 8 o'clock and ending at 5 p.m. Did you have another question, please? Um, I appreciate some clarification about certificates of residence as opposed to certificates of identity. I understand the 1892 Geary Act required certificates of residence, and at some point I guess it changed to certificates of identity. But then also in 1924 with that Immigration Act, it expanded exclusion to all Asians. So were they also required to carry either certificates of residence or certificates of identity? You know, I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that our Exclusion Act case files um, are only Chinese. Okay. Uh, we don't have them for any other Asian population. Um, San Francisco.
Cisco appears to have a few that are uh, non-Chinese Asian, but I I honestly don't know how it was um, enforced for other Asian populations. Fair enough. I think that satisfied our questioner. Um, at this point, I think we'll end our presentation. I want to thank Susan Karen so much for coming in and broadcasting from uh, all the way from Seattle, Washington. And please know that this presentation video recording will remain on YouTube, and you can download her presentation slides from there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sue, for uh, doing this presentation for us. My pleasure. I love these files. They're great.